Um, well, to follow on what Naftali was saying, um, thank you all for being here today. We're thrilled to be able to host this as part of our community conversations. And we are delighted to have both Hernan and Naftali bringing um, to the table some uh, great conversation for all of you to participate in. So we hope that you'll join us in the future for other um, follow on conversations to this um, topic area. And we hope to see you all in Boise um, in October. So I will turn it over to Neftali. Great. Uh, thank you, Tanya. So Tanya, for those of you who don't know, Tanya is our business manager Forgot and also works in member engagement, particularly in these community conversations where we just bring folks together quickly around key areas that people want to talk about. And this is an area that um, has been percolating in my mind for a long time. And then I had a conversation with my new friend, Hernan, um, and we're like, hey, let's just like get folks together to talk about this because I'm having conversations individually with a bunch of people. You seem real passionate about this. So let's come together around this topic. And the more we actually have talked about it, the more interesting the topic has become as we've dig dug into the depths of the history of behavioral scientists in family medicine and medicine in general. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, it's interactive, there's no slides, there's no, uh, there's not webinar style. This is intended to really elicit conversation and hopefully out of that potentially elicit potentially some action, right? Are there things that we can do together to help e support one another, to help advocate for one another? And particularly in this particular area, um, I think help advocate in the world of family medicine and specifically in our departments. Um, just as a quick intro for myself, um, uh, my name is Neftali Serrano or Neftali Serrano, whichever way you're able to say it. If you can roll your R's, uh, uh, have fun with it. So uh, I am the CEO here at the Collaborative Family Healthcare Association, and we exist to support all the efforts across the country to integrate physical and behavioral health. And of course, you all know that a lot of that, um, or at least a good portion of that, has centered around family medicine. Um, and so I clinically um, have the privilege of working at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, volunteering there um, for some of my clinical work. And that's due to um, my friend Linda Meyer Holtz, who I also want to give a shout out to. So, Linda, wave so people know who you are. And uh, Linda is a behavioral scientist at UNC um, and is also the president of the board of STFM, the new president as of May. So, so glad to have Linda here part of this conversation. She knows a whole lot more about this topic than, than I do, frankly. I'm more of an interested observer and participant in the sense that I've worked in family medicine or with family medicine departments for much of my career, never in the behavioral scientist role, but often in the role of clinician slash chief behavioral health officer um, associated with those departments. So I've had a sort of an outsider view of what it, it is like for behavioral scientists to work in family medicine. And then as a technical assistance consultant, uh, two clinics, I've worked with many family medicine departments working to integrate care. All right, so that's enough background. Um, what I'd like to do is start off this conversation by allowing Hernan to introduce himself as my co-facilitator. And then I'm gonna start the conversation by asking Hernan, Hernan a question, but I'm gonna prime all of you as a group for that question. And I want you to put in the chat, if you're able to, your perspective on that particular question. So here's the question and then Hernan can introduce, so you can, guys can be thinking and typing as he introduces. The question is, over the course of your career, no matter how short it's been or how long, what challenges, or you can frame it opportunities, do you feel like you've had vis-a-vis -vis the definition of your role in family medicine? Um, so think about what challenges you've faced potentially as far as people understanding what you do, uh, as far as uh, folks, uh, your department utilizing you effectively um, or potentially um, applying the range of skills that you bring as behavioral scientists 
to the world of family medicine. What challenges have you seen over your career around that component? So that's the question that I'm gonna start us off with. So now, Hernan, uh, tell us a little bit about you and then why you were even interested in talking about this with me. The first thing is I want to say thank you that you are pronouncing my name in the way that it is. <laughs> Here in the United States, probably there are a thousand different versions of my name, and this is a perfect pronunciation. I want to say, say thank you for that. So yes, I am Roman Barenboim. and all of you can hear my perfect Wisconsin accent. It's just because I practice a lot of practice behind hours of practice. I am originally from Argentina, where I am a psychologist. Here in the States, I am a medical family therapy PhD, and I am the director of behavioral science in the Medical College of Wisconsin here in Milwaukee, where I am working in, a, in, a, in one of our residencies uh, and now moving to another residency in the, in the same system in a couple of months that we open in the South area. And uh, I started probably with all of this uh, world of, of integrated care and, and behavioral science in 2015, when I was doing my PhD in family therapy, and they decided one day to change into medical family therapy. And I said, what is this medical family therapy, <laughs> you know? So since then I started, you know, working more close to integrated care. And then um, I took my position five years ago here in the medical college as, as behavioral science director. One of them, you know, Thinking on your question, uh, and Naftali, one of the first things that come to my mind is kind of uh, what is my identity uh, being a behavioral science director? I am much more in charge of education. I am much more trying to manage service delivery of integrated care. Uh, my focus should be more the residents, the patients, the faculty. Uh, the world of a, of a behavioral scientist in general for what I see in our positions differ a lot. I see some people with part-time positions that they are not even uh, behavioralists before. I see people with full-time positions seeing patients, some people without seeing patients. So I see that there is no a clear you know, definition of, of, of our role. And uh, my, my, my enthusiasm when, when we speak when we, when we spoke last time, Neftali, is because I really think that integrated care is kind of our future um, in, for several things, for value, for value based uh, type of, of payment. So we, we don't have to, we can add actually a little more value to what we do. But, but basically, for this interaction between medical clinicians and behavioral mm -hmm. clinicians. So I see a lot of challenges in, in developing our, our, uh, our, our educational programs, but also to trying to balance what is, what is my role, you know, because um, also because I am clearly, I am a, a Latino, I am also kind of in charge in every residency that I go about uh, diversity, equality, and belonging type of efforts and anti-racism. So sometimes I see that I have probably a hundred different hats that I have to fill out, and, and this can be challenging. Um, more when you when you are in an academic setting that also at some point we dream to go for promotion or something similar. So it's like what I have to do to write more papers, to do integrated care and take, uh, you know, uh, warm hand ups for brief interventions. So it's, it's kind of, um, I think that, 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 that we are going in a, in a good direction because at least we need to have more of these conversations. So this was my really my motivation to, to speak with you and to see how also we can you know, connect more uh, the Forum of Behavioral Science, SDFM, CFHA, because we are all, with, we are all, all of us, we are in the same ship. Awesome, thanks. So um, I'm gonna open it up to the group, but I'm gonna further spice the conversation a little bit um, to, to get your, your thoughts on this. So, um, I'll put this link in the chat. There's a, an article in Family Systems and Health that appeared in 2012, so about 10 years ago now, uh, covering the history of behavioral science scientists in medicine. So really going back even up to the early 1900s, um, but especially covering recent years and the challenges, many of which I hope to, that we can talk about here. But there's a quote in the article 
that I thought was really poignant. And I want you all to think about, does this still apply to you all um, on some level? So this is a quote from um, a psychologist, Marilyn Mirror. Um, and actually this was from back in 2001 when there was a meeting of behavioral scientists um, at a conference called Keystone. And this was what she said in reflecting on her role in family medicine. Quote, as a psychologist working in family medicine, I've spent the past 22 years as a guest at the table of family medicine. As such, I've enjoyed a warm welcome, stimulating dinner conversation and extraordinary menus. I realize, however, that I will always be present at the table as a guest, one who lives in one of the neighboring blind alleys and will never be listed on the family genogram. That kind of made me sad. <laughs> <laughs> when I read that. And I've had similar feelings when I interact with some behavioral scientists in their departments. And I thought, hmm, this is something we ought to do something about because these are highly talented individuals, valuable, precious commodities in the world of family medicine. So I'll open it up to the group. When you think about your role, the way you're understood in your departments, and in particular, as you think about it in connection with perhaps demands by the department to do integrated care or to build programs, in addition to, as Hinnan said, all the other things that you're supposed to be in charge of. Um, is, am, am I describing that correctly? Are, are you feeling like that's, that's right? Or, or are there actually some nuances in the way that your roles are emerging, perhaps as a new generation of folks in family medicine? I'll open the floor to you all. And feel free to unmute yourself as you wish. Go ahead, Linda. That's, yeah, it, that's an interesting quote. And it reminds me of something that I heard at, I think it was a forum presentation about the role of behavioral scientists. And this was years and years ago. Um, the presenter talked about the fact of being like an aunt, a beloved aunt but an aunt in the family of, of family medicine. Um, so similar kind of perspective that you're there, you're invited, you are beloved, but it is always a little bit different kind of role to some degree. Um, and I would say I've had the opportunity to work in two different, very different kinds of residencies. One initially where it, the focus was definitely on teaching. And I had to fight for every teaching moment and felt like it was almost like I was there to check off a box. And I really had to continue to advocate for why the curriculum was so critical and important um, in the context of everything else that the residents were trying to learn. Um, and then another residency where perceive the value of the behavioral health curriculum tremendously. And yet the challenge is balancing the clinical demands. In this residency program, all faculty are expected to do a lot of clinical care. And we have a large residency program and I'm the only behavioral scientist. And so it's really that tension between sort of being part of the team and making sure that I'm pulling my weight in doing clinical care while knowing that I could do 150% of my time just focused on the residents and that still wouldn't be enough. So for me, that's a considerable tension. I see a lot of heads nodding, Linda. So I think you uh, described the situation well. I wonder if I could follow up with you as you've tried to advocate within your roles, uh, either at your current locate, uh, uh, current residency or others, um, have you found some uh, receptivity, some, some ability to um, proactively define your role vis-a-vis -vis the residency uh, leadership? Or has that been really challenging for folks to really get you and get what, you're, what you bring to the table and the range of things that they're actually placing on you, perhaps without knowing it? 
I think that as behavioral scientists, we often get tasked to do a lot of different things because we have that expertise in program assessment and evaluation and in wellness and well-being initiatives. So we get tapped into those kinds of things, diversity curriculum or asked to really reflect on. So I think, you know, one of the challenges is sort of saying, I'm still, you know, how do we sometimes set limits on what we can do then? Because it's easy for us to continue to say yes, yes, yes. Um, and before you know it, we are burning ourselves out. Um, and I think that that's where these kinds of conversations are so helpful is to learn about what other people are doing and um, how can we use, I've been able to use some data to help substantiate um, why I'm not saying yes to some new things right now um, to kind of point out, for example, what, how much time clinically do most behavioral scientists who teach in family medicine typically are they required to do? Um, and bringing that into the conversation has been helpful. Um, but I think it's an ongoing advocacy and um, understanding the power structure in your program, I think is really helpful and who really has the ability to make changes um, to free up your time. And it may not necessarily be the program director. Um, and, maybe the chair of the department that you really have to advocate with or the business operations person um, who's really looking at the budget. And so figuring that out then I think has allowed me to be a little bit more successful in advocating for reallocation of my time to some degree. I, I really completely agree with you, Linda. All years for us is the negotiation about the clinical time if it is 30%, 50%, sometimes we hear that they want to take it until 60%. Uh, and this is, this is the question they have for, for the rest of the group. How, how are you handling your, your clinical time? Because this is a, a heavy subject for us. Yeah, and you can feel free to either chime up or, or put it in the chat uh, as well. Because yeah, that's a key key question, um, but I wanna point us actually to some of the questions behind the questions, right? Because when I've interacted with residency programs and when, when I often am interacting, I'm interacting in the context of consultation and I'm helping the program integrate care, develop a PCBH program or COCM program, whatever it is. And I, I see the tension involved in the politics of the department around this question around clinical time. But behind that are some really larger questions around who do you think this behavioral scientist is? Like you already have this staff person, but who do you think this person is? And my, my uh, sort of learning over the years is that I don't really think that many departments know who this person is as far as the range of roles that they have, what their skills are, et cetera. And thus, they are then posing this idea of enhanced clinical time as a way to create that rationale for the person, right? It's almost like, well, you have to have some place here, so you might as well be revenue, revenue, revenue generating, right? So I think that's the question behind the question, because to Linda's point, actually, you all are doing a whole lot of stuff, but I don't know if the department is, I don't know if it's a value thing or if it's an awareness thing um, or if it's just a straightforward disconnect thing, right? Sort of the checkbox thing um, around that. So yeah, your thoughts around this, this dynamic of clinical time versus really valuing the other components that you bring to the table. This is, here we have uh, Neftali, Barbara Carver is in 50% clinical time and often pull it into clinical when teaching. So even in teaching time, she, she has to, to do some, some clinical time. Uh, Joshua says we are six half days in clinical uh, care and there are five BH faculty in our residency and we are definitely expected to see patients and generate revenue and teach. Uh, Shoif 
80, 85% clinical time. Joey, I'm feeling for you right now, man. <laughs> I, maybe, I, I, maybe we can give Joey some, some uh, airtime here because apparently 120%, 120% is not a good week. <laughs> it's not a good week. And, and for context, I, I'm one of two behavioral health faculty in, in, in my department. And, and so it's, it's not me doing everything by myself. Um, but I, I mean, this has been on top of my mind. I, I have an annual review actually tomorrow and I've, I've marked up my effort letter with a lot of uh, suggestions. Um, and I, you know, I think there is like a mismatch on in terms of like what's on paper in terms of the expectations and then what is sort of plays out in terms of what you're asked to do, what you know, or, or even what, what, what you're expected to do, <clears throat> um, which would be not ideal, but manageable if there weren't also kind of like, you know, the specter of, well, we're going to look at your work RVUs at the end of each month and, and see where you're at. And so, you know, I think something kind of has to give in that situation. So hopefully we'll have a helpful discussion tomorrow to kind of clarify some things, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's just a big challenge. I was thinking 85% clinical time with clinical notes, you don't have time to teach. Yeah. But actually, you don't have so much time to breathe, actually, no, even. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Joey, you bring up a really great um, point around a particular skill set that uh, maybe is a skill set for this group to help each other with, which is negotiation. Um, because that is actually a, a really important thing to know to do when dealing with uh, program leaders in these roles. And when you don't have peers necessarily, you have peers in your group, but lots of residency programs don't, you know, the behavioral sciences doesn't really have a peer. And so there's no one to compare to and no sort of block of folks to kind of uh, help each other with. Um, and, and the art of negotiation is really important. And probably back to your point, Linda, around getting data together um, and maybe even coalescing as a group and sharing like what standards are, right? Um, what, is the, what is the sort of community standard for behavioral scientists vis-a-vis -vis clinical work versus, clinical, versus teaching time versus program development time versus you know, committee time and all that other stuff, right? Um, yeah, and to that point, I wanna ask uh, my friend Winslow, cause I know he's gotta go here soon, but Winslow actually went through a recent negotiation process with his organization. And in fact, he and his colleagues went through that. We were working together um, on some of that. So Winslow, you see your friend Joey there in the corner of my screen. If you were to give Joey some advice around negotiating around these pieces, what do you think has worked in your years in, in uh, family medicine? Because I think you've been uh, fairly effective. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I don't know what's worked. I don't know if it's working. I, for me, it's detailing. I think it started with detailing out in columns because I get asked, or I, I, and I'm sure others can relate, I get asked and pulled into all kinds of different um, roles. So, and sometimes in a reactive sense, there's a resident in difficulty, they want me to consult on that. There's recruitment issues and they want me to consult on that. There's, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion type things and they want my input on that. There's a committee or credentialing issue with an incoming resident and that has, you know, a history of, you know, a substance use disorder or something like that. They want my input on that. So they want like a non-physician or behavioral science input. And so for me, I started creating, I created a table with columns around all these different things. And it was between like the sponsoring institution and the residency. And, um, and I was getting pulled in lots of different directions. So I just created that and just detailed out and just kept adding to that. And, you know, they wanted my input and administrative support on scholarly activities and, um, and then they wanted clinical productivity and then they didn't know what the clinical productivity should look like and they were pushing for psychotherapy because that was more easily reimbursed and uh, I wanted to do more kind of PCBH integrated care but that was in Idaho was harder to reimburse and so then detail like so I just, 
And then I kind of overwhelmed my PD with that. And then like Linda said, it was finding the right people to talk to. And then, and then it took years of like kind of revisiting that. And one part of that was just having twice a year meetings. Um, and my PD will sometimes say, he's like, I meet with you more than any other faculty person to kind of go over this. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm one, I'm one person who is <laughs> like gets pulled into uh, all of these different things. And, and, and it's in fits and spurts, so it's hard to add it up. And it's, you know, one week it's, you know, this, and during recruitment season, it looks like this. And then, um, so it was having all of that in one place and being, and in the, at my most recent contract where I was pushing away from more traditional psychotherapy to try to get more time for PCBH and also have time for the research and, and pull out of some of the, you know, sponsoring institution stuff that I'd gotten dragged into the admin kind of operational life, operation stuff. I, uh, in that meeting, he's like, wow, you, this is a lot of meetings for you, huh? And, and I, and I was like, yeah, it, it is. Um, so it's kind of like that slow, he just didn't know, but I'm in a program where I do feel really supported by the PD and he sees my value. So I feel lucky in that sense. I want to add something to that wisdom that, that probably you, Linda, can, can help clarify a little more. That is, what is the definition of clinical time? Because my MD or the O's faculty, the, the precepting time is counting as clinical because in the eyes of the medical college, they are billing for this time. But when I precept someone, they don't count it as clinical. So sometimes it's, it's really difficult for, for me to try to... to to tell, but when I am presenting, what is the difference? Just that I am not bringing money for that. And, and it's a difficult conversation to have, <laughs> you know, that, that sometimes they involves a lot of sweating and spams in your neck because it's not fair. Interestingly, yeah. that is a conversation I am negotiating this week um, because yeah, historically, our, my clinical time is just seeing patients, RVUs that I generate. And um, we're gonna be having an expansion of our internship for psychology graduate students. And those folks, it looks like we're gonna be able to figure out a way to get some of that as billable time. So my argument is if I'm gonna be precepting at least our psychology graduate students, shouldn't that be included in my clinic time just as it would be for any other medical faculty. Um, I'll let you know how that goes. Um, I've got the, well, we'll look into it response. Um, just since we mentioned data, um, based on a survey that I did of behavioral scientists through STFM, um, in, this was data that I gathered last fall, so 2021. Um, I had responses from 109 behavioral scientists and the range of clinical time that they reported was everything from zero to 90%. <laughs> so there is huge variation. The mean itself was 33% clinical time, but a standard deviation of 22. Um, so it varies tremendously um, for those of us who have this kind of a role. And I think that these variations sometimes help us, sometimes don't help us, because it's really difficult to defend something when there is no one unification and, and something that most of the people is doing. So you can say, everyone else is doing this. I don't, we don't have this chance. What, one last thing that just popped in my head that was really helpful for me is I honed in on what my professional identity was, like what brings brought me joy. And for me, it's, I am a family medicine educator. I, I really love teaching family medicine residents and kind of preparing them to go out. And I really believe in family medicine and its mission. And that helped me. I have colleagues who are also behavioral scientists who are like, I love training psychology students or interns or postdocs. And I want to do that in family medicine. I want to support family medicine, but their identity, and I'll do the, you know, I can teach the curriculum, but I really love that. I have others who are like, I love clinical delivery. Like I love patient care and I can teach and I can do that. And so for me, then when I meet with my PD, I'm like, what brings me joy is integrating, working and teaching family medicine. So anything, any way that I can pull that in. And fortunately he wants me to, you know, be happy in my job, but then I can relate every, I'm like, 
me doing psychotherapy doesn't, I'm like in a different building. I'm in a different room. I'm, you know, I, like I'm not, whereas if I'm in the clinic, I'm doing, you know, doing in PCBH, I'm, I can do that with the interns or with the residents. And I love that. And it, you know, so I just then related everything back to what he cared about, which was educating family medicine residents that aligned with me and that worked. I, I can't emphasize that more because that variation that you were talking about in none is fine as long as the program has a clear sense or mission behind the behavioral science component of its work. Um, and as you mentioned before, Ednan, and maybe you can elaborate on this and others who know this much better than I do, ACGME has some fairly generic uh, definitions of what this role is, which is why there is so much variation. But then it seems to me that it's up to the program to really define what it is that we're trying to accomplish here with behavioral medicine, right? And within that, there can be variation, but it, the program has to understand it itself in order to truly value and then determine the work uh, components, right? Is it gonna be 90% clinical or 10% clinical? It doesn't matter as long as the clinic really has a, a solid mission around what it's trying to accomplish. And I think that's the, the mismatch. What I have seen externally is that the mismatch between the personnel and the, as you rightly put it, Winslow, the joy that they derive from their career and the skills that they feel like they bring in the mission or the lack of clarity around mission is really to me the main rub uh, for, for folks in family medicine where they may not have as kind a PD as Winslow has or, or oftentimes what I've found actually is a very obtuse structure, organizational structure, where like I've seen behavioral scientist fo folks, behavioral science folks who don't even know who their boss is really, right? And that gets really, it's, it just feels uncomfortable to not feel like you have a sense of place missionally within what family medicine is doing. I, I cannot agree more with you, Neftali. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna redirect this to Linda because I remember your presentation, Linda, two years ago about the previous survey that you did for the salaries of behavioral science that I, I remember that you said, I have a problems with outliers. I remember you saying that, Linda, because you said, is so we have so much variation that psychologists doing this, some psychiatrists, some in this, that was really difficult to, to know what is the, 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 the average of, of our salary. So I want to redirect that to you because you have much more information and than, than me on that. Yeah, I'm glad that this is just a salary survey that I run periodically every few years. It was started by Sam Romano. Um, so I've got to give kudos and a shout out to my beloved mentor with that um, and just picked up, partnered with him when he was living and then um, took it over and have continued to do it just kind of as a service to our community. Um, because again, the more data we have, the more helpful we can be to each other. Carly, I noticed that you had unmuted and I wanted to give you an opportunity. Yeah, I was just going to say that the I think the main thing that I run into that becomes such a barrier is who, who am I owned by? Because I, uh, as a psychologist, am owned by the institution. So the hospital is my employer, um, but all of my role is within family medicine. So for a while, no one knew who I reported to. So I reported to the COO of the hospital because they didn't know on paper who made sense for me to report to. And it got very confusing because no one like owns me. So no one takes responsibility for like, what division of my clinical duties there are because technically I'm just a clinical psychologist through my hospital so they don't understand why I'm only 50% clinical and what else I'm doing with my time and it gets very very challenging and so then you know the data that you have uh, brought forth with the salary and the clinical time has been very very helpful um, and I get lots of support from my department but it's the beyond that that has no concept. And those are the actual decision makers of my role. And I find that that's like the main thing that I run into constantly that I think is a huge barrier for people that are within different systems that maybe um, they're not owned by the physicians group or 
their department doesn't actually own their time or whatever it may be. And that may be something that needs to be really thought through when we're trying to explain, expand the idea of behavioral health in family medicine is like really advocating for ownership. Um, just like the idea of patient ownership, if they don't actually own, I hate the word own, that sounds so weird, but like, who do we actually like report to and that kind of thing, it gets super weird because I had a chair who was like, well, you don't report to me. So I, I don't, I don't care is the word you used at one point, luckily is no longer the chair. Um, but that creates so, so much animosity. <laughs> so. so. So Carly, your, your direct line of report is not to, the, to your PD? Nope. So uh, unofficially, yes, but not on any paper. So like who does my evaluation? Who decides if I get a raise? Anything like that is some random person it used to be the coo of the hospital now it's like some random administrator for a while it was my clinic director but they were like this doesn't make sense because i'm a nurse and i why is a psychologist reporting to me so well you're you're not alone carly um as i said before <laughs> i've spoken to lots of folks in that situation mm -hmm. um and that's why actually I referenced Winslow earlier because we talked a little bit about that too within his organization. He's got colleagues who are actually under different hierarchical structures within the same mm -hmm. larger institution. So it gets even more com convoluted there, layers upon layers of who owns you and your work. And then it becomes, again, it's a skill that we weren't taught in. I mean, I, don't, I didn't have any classes on negotiation organizational hierarchy and its impact on behavioral science um, and uh, creating your own place uh, in within the organizational hierarchy, I think is, is uh, an ongoing huge challenge. Barbara, if you don't mind, I'd like to get you in the conversation because I know you need to leave soon. Uh, you said you needed, had some clinical work to do. So before you go, would you be willing to give us some of your thoughts around what you've been hearing and how it applies to your setting? Yeah, I think it's complicated. This is something we struggle a lot with. Um, the initially, I the person before me in my position was half of their time was paid by outpatient behavioral health and half of it was paid by the residency. And then when I came in, somehow we were able to finagle things that the residency now pays for all my time. But we have other behavioral health people in our clinic who are paid by behavioral health. Um, so then there's some weird conflicts there because I'm doing clinical care too. And how do I get a raise? Because what if behavioral health gets a raise, but I don't get a raise? And then when do I get a raise? Because there's no one else like me in the system. <laughs> um, and they don't know what to do with me reporting. I report to my program director, but then the clinic manager, who's a nurse, has to sign off on my review um, that my program director does, and he tells her, this is what you have to do, and she signs a paper, but that's ridiculous. Um, and we've advocated for a contract, everyone else has a contract, um, and now it's we've advocate, advocated for three years to get a contract, and there's still no contract. Um, so every year I have to negotiate my CME and um, in some ways it's good because they don't know what I do and I can fly under the radar. <laughs> um, and then sometimes it's not in your advantage that they don't know what you do. So it can be both ways. Sometimes it comes in handy. Um, it's complicated because we do all sorts of stuff. Oh, this person might quit. Can you go talk to them? Oh, this person's having a crisis. Can you go out to the lobby and talk to them? That's not anywhere in my schedule and it's not documented and I don't get paid for that, you know, from a clinical perspective. Um, so I think it's hard to do a lot and it's hard to document what we do. Um, and I think that's true if you do an integrated behavioral health model too. In those positions from a clinical perspective, you do a lot of stuff that's not documented and hard to document and get number crunchers to understand like, well, no, I'm not just twiddling my thumbs over here. Um, I'm quite busy. It just doesn't show up in your spreadsheet. Um, so that's just an ongoing battle, which I think we just have to keep fighting a little bit each time and you make a little progress and then you have to take a little break and then you fight a little bit more, take a little break and slowly you get up the mountain, but I think it's an ongoing mountain that we're gonna always be climbing. I know I know about all the patients that you have, Barb, because Barb and me were in the same group in the 
behavioral fellowship in SDFM. So we shared a lot of, of all of these uh, problems and challenges for a long time. And, and I completely agree with you that sometimes, you know, it's not clear what is our shop description. And I want to bring to the conversation my favorite mentor ever that is here, Chef Ring. He's making in the in the in the chat uh, an amazing an amazing comment that is sometimes I was responsible for the behavioral results of the test with ACGME. Chef, can elaborate you a little more on that because it's so interesting. What are you saying there? <laughs> Yeah, it's really hard to get a clear job description. You know, just like you were saying, Barbara, it's like all over the place. Um, but but there was one thing that was extraordinarily clear, and it was the first thing said to me um, when I started, which was my program director saying, um, the scores on behavioral health um, items um, are your responsibility, and um, you are accountable for having them be, you know, in the high passing range. And that feels like so out of my control. I mean, I, I, I can, you know, I can try and teach to the test. I can be innovative and creative, but that, that was, I mean, that, that I, I, for some reason that just really came to me in this conversation as one of the very muddled and complicated and nuanced challenges amongst a list of many nuanced and muddled and complex challenges that fall upon us. Um, so, um, you know, I, I don't know what else to say about that, except, um, you know, I, 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 I was blessed to have a, uh, a program director who believed in hiring good people and getting out of their way. And so we have full latitude for all kinds of crazy, innovative, playful gamification approaches to learning. And actually that did turn out to be helpful for those scores and exam items as well as other things. But um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's hard to, to, to march forward on a, on a role um, when you really don't know what the parameters are it's why I'm so grateful for, for this organization and for these kinds of co connections, right? And, and STFM as well. That these are the places that have really helped me um, uh, learn best practices and, uh, and just be exposed to extraordinary innovation in, in education. I, I also remember the, in one of our mentee mentor sessions, you, you introduced me to the negotiations, you introduced me to the hardware, I don't remember, but the, the hardware uh, business negotiation report of Samsung Chef. And how this help you in, because, you know, you have a, an amazing trajectory in this field. How this help you to try to, or how, what advice you can give us about how to negotiate further our, our roles? Yeah, um, uh, you know, I, I, um, I do a lot of leadership coaching for physician leaders these days. So I'm, I'm interested in, in kind of another area, but, but certainly you're, you're, you're right on point, Neftali. We all could grow in, in these areas. My, I do subscribe to the um, Harvard Business Review, just the online version. And I get a daily alert with five articles and they are, um, some of them are things I'm not really interested in. Some of the things are incredibly relevant and some things I'm not interested in, but I'm like, oh, I should read that because I want to figure what that is. Anyway, it's just another um, a resource that keeps me sort of on my toes in um, thinking, um, you know, about the role of psychologists, psychologists um, and, and leadership and high functioning teams uh, in the face of, you know, all of these, all of these challenges. You know, Barbara, I really resonate to what you said, like, Ah, there's a crisis in the waiting room, Jeff. <laughs> like, ah, you know, I've got four four patients and two teaching sessions, and yet I'll see you there in a minute, right? That's what we do, firefighters. Which I think is a really fun part of our job too. Um, I just think it's hard to help other people understand what we're doing um, with all that time we have. Yeah, and um, yeah, in a piece we haven't talked. Uh, in depth about, but maybe for a future conversation is actually that in recent years, thrown at you all has been this whole notion of integrated care. So your organizations have like thrown at the behavioral scientists, oh, don't, don't you do uh, behavioral stuff? There's this integrated care stuff. Can't, can't you do it? You know, um, without a whole lot of understanding of the sort of mind-blowing shift that that actually means for clinical service delivery, program development, teaching, and all these other uh, really important things that you all do. Um, I'd like to shift the conversation, if it's okay, to maybe talking about in the last few minutes, we have some things to do. Um, so I think it's helpful to talk and on some level, 
commiserate, support each other, et cetera. And um, by commiserate, I, I don't mean to say that in a negative way, because if anything, I hope that you walk away feeling extra validated today, because everything I've heard is like, holy smoke, these people do so much in their roles. I mean, you all do like a tremendous number of things. You exercise a, an array of skills that is impressive. Like there's few clinical positions for psychologists or other mental health professionals where you have to exercise so many skills concurrently, right? And so I hope you feel really validated today that, yeah, you know, I do do a lot of stuff and, and I bring a lot to the table. Uh, the issue is not that. Uh, the issue are other issues, right? Uh, role definition, organizational hierarchy, uh, missional definition uh, for, the, for the entity, uh, protected time, you know, et cetera. So, but I'd like to just see what this group thinks about what its needs are. And by the way, I don't have any agenda here. So I really just, if one and done is fine and you all feel like, hey, this is great. This is all we need to do. That's fantastic. That's great. But do y'all have thoughts about how, maybe you already do this. Maybe you already do this through STFM. Maybe you already help each other through other organizations or through other conferences or other entities. I don't know. Um, but are, are there things that um, you think this group and other colleagues who weren't able to attend, lots of people said, hey, we can't attend this particular meeting, but we'd love to attend, you think would be helpful? Um, and I'm very tactical in my thinking, so I'll just throw out a couple of thoughts here around things like, um, you know, some of the skill development, um, skill development around negotiations, um, uh, maybe some coalescing around uh, criteria, you know, you all in a sense are, can be a sort of union and you can decide we're gonna to get together and define a little bit better what we do as a, as a role, you know, and maybe you put a white paper out around what it means to be behavioral science faculty in, in modern day family medicine residencies. I don't know. I'm just throwing out thoughts that, you know, might be interesting. So any thoughts around what you think you want or what you think having talked this could lead to? And yes, feel free to um, also respond to Winslow's comment there about folks that are newer uh, in the profession as well. I would be interested at, at some point, and maybe there's a venue to do this, to um, talk a little bit more about people who have integrated behavioral health in their residency program and how they balance doing integrated behavioral health and still teaching residents to do what they need to do. I have concerns that some of our residents depend too much on integrated behavioral health and they're lacking skill development because they don't have to do it because we're there. Um, despite a lot of my efforts to make some boundaries with that, I've failed. Um, and how do we balance patient care and educating the residents and making sure when they go on their own, if they are not lucky enough to have uh, integrated behavioral health that they know some basics of what to do. Um, so I think that would be a really helpful discussion at some point to have somewhere. I, I would agree with you on that. That is that is a big issue for us as well. Uh, I would love to have that conversation. Maybe not today, but another time perhaps. One, one question, Neftali, that I think that that is going to open a lot of new doors for us in the future is that probably if you can, you know, give us in the in, in another group some more ideas about what are you working now in value base, that probably the, the more money that you bring to the table, generally the more power that you can have in order for negotiation and leverage. So if we can, you know, show what is our value, intangibles, but also tangibles, uh, probably is gonna is gonna give us another role in the in the negotiation table. I do think with the new program revisions for family medicine education, with the emphasis on residents having to train in integrated care settings, that there's going to be more exploration of what that really looks like across different residencies. Um, 
because I know it varies tremendously in one program, it might be the behavioral scientist seeing a half day a week patients on their own. Um, and they're going to call that integrated care in other programs where, you know, you've got patient-centered medical home model going, you may have collaborative care model going um, with a team of individuals. So there's going to be dramatic differences in how do we help support programs um, that are in the infancy of integrated care um, and help develop that without overwhelming the behavioral scientist faculty member. Um, and it, it definitely ties into some things you were saying, Hermione, too, in terms of payment and, you know, that pressure between what do I bill, how can I bill out the most RVUs, because I know that's the message I get, versus what's the best clinical care that I could be providing, or what's the best system of training for the residents. That's, there's tension there that I feel oftentimes, but I do think there's gonna be some really nice opportunities for us to explore what this means across residency programs. And I know SDFM is um, doing some proposals to the ABFM to study this a little bit more and try and get a better understanding of what integrated care really looks like in residency programs in particular. There have been some studies that look across the country, but not specific in residency programs. And I think that's gonna help drive some options going forward. You know, it can be great to continue building bridges between SDFM and CFHA. It's yeah, I was going to say, um, Linda, what do you think about the idea of, of um, just officially co-hosting a, a group to meet up again between the SDFM and, and CFHA, given the overlap in interest and content? Right. There's a tremendous amount of overlap and overlap in members. Um, yeah. yeah, definitely. So I know that one of the things that STFM was trying to do and get ABFM to fund was an actual summit to bring together folks. And you know, one of the things I said is we definitely need representation from CFHA. Um, ABFM is asking us to do something a little bit different before they're willing to fund that yet. So it's probably a year away. So I think there will be a more formal thought gathering of individuals, but that doesn't preclude us from starting that work in this way. Awesome. Well, I will connect with you offline and see who I can connect with on your team there just to kind of say, hey, how do we, how do we um, join forces on this? So there's some great things on the chat. Um, thank you all for commenting on that. Um, so like your point, Linda, about discussion on the implementation of the accreditation standards, I'm wondering, show of hands, do you, do you all, have you all seen the new accreditation standards, read them, understand them, have a clear sense of what they are? I read them. I cannot say that I understand them. Okay. All right. Yeah, there's a couple of shaking heads. No. Does anybody feel like they have some clarity around the accreditation standards that they could share with the group potentially? <laughs> I mean, I've been a little bit more involved with it um, through my role with STFM. And what I can say is that the draft standards that were published and sent out for comment um, underwent some additional revisions, but then had to go from the writing group to the ACGME group that approves. I don't know exactly what their title is off the top of my head. Um, the feedback that we're getting is that they're pushing back on some things. So some of the things that we thought were going to be in the standards may or may not be. Um, I don't think that that's going to impact the standard that says we've got to train within integrated care models. Um, I think that's going to be there. Um, but some of the other standards, um, particularly around protected time for faculty, um, may not go through in the way that we wanted them to and advocated for. Um, so that will be interesting because um, that relates to this conversation as well in terms of protecting time for faculty to actually teach um, and do the other parts of our job that are so important. Um, so I'm waiting to see. They're supposed to be meeting um, and we're hoping to get the final 
approvals or the final standards in early July. So that'll be interesting. Well, um, I like to be respectful of everyone's time. We're at the top of the hour. Some of you might have a patient at the top of the hour <laughs> and on to the different responsibilities that we just talked about. Um, I just, no commitment here. Um, so I'm gonna be reaching out to Linda and see if we can connect with STFM on something a little bit joint because it seems to me in a way um, that at least additional conversation would be helpful and, and uh, coalescing around this. Um, Ednan was kind enough to really shape this conversation, co-facilitate today, but I don't wanna put this all on Ednan to do. Are there other folks who just, if you could put in the chat or show of hands would be interested in future co-facilitation of any conversations? Um, could you just either let me know now or send me an email afterwards just so that we can distribute the load so to speak, right? Um, so if you are interested in co-facilitating, let me know. And then obviously we'll work on the uh, STFM side, assuming we can get something going, we can get a co-facilitator uh, that they, they might wanna choose as well. Although many of you belong to both organizations, so it kind of doesn't matter. So uh, yeah, so put your name in the chat if you do. Um, uh, are interested in, or sending me an email. Now, I wanna end today with just a moment of gratitude. Um, whenever we're working on these issues, um, I, I hope that we come at it with a sense of optimism. Um, and I love that, I wish Barbara was here uh, still, but like, I love what she said about that idea of like, you fight a little and you rest a little, and then you fight a little and then you rest a little. That, that rings true to me <laughs> about a lot of life. <laughs> and so I, I, I want you all to kind of have a sense of, of, uh, of optimism and gratitude as we leave today uh, about your roles, about the contribution you make across everything that you do. Um, because that's right. You should feel a sense of accomplishment uh, and a sense of the goodness of the work that you engage in every day, even if there are these ways in which it is not entirely recognized by others around you. Um, yeah, Linda, I think you do have a tremendous job. <laughs> like, it's, a, it's amazing. Um, and uh, these challenges are things that I think with some community organizing um, and some mutual support, I think they're things we can overcome. And in fact, I think the link between SDFM and CFHA on this issue in particular is that integrated care is kind of a window to that um, for folks. And I think we need to take advantage of that window um, to champion your roles and, and make your lives a little bit less chaotic. So uh, take a moment at the end of this. Once you log off, I just, before you jump on to the next email, and the next thing, just take 30 seconds, breathe in a little bit and feel and express some thankfulness for the work that you do every day and know that it is appreciated. So thank you all and we'll be in touch.